Dr. Andres de Cardenas, but everybody calls me Andy. Homestead, turn five. I'm in a four-wheel drift. One of the faster cars comes behind me, just touches my rear end, gets me completely loose, and the car hits the wall. This is my Shelby Cobra of my dream. Why are you a car guy? Well, it all started to tell us a little kid. All right, you gotta understand. I was born from Cuban immigrants in the 1960s. These people are poor. My dad was my age when I was born, type people. He was 50 years old, okay? So imagine having to start all over again. We were in Birmingham, Alabama. We were dirt poor. Well, my godfather, which used to work for Sterling Company, which was a truck company, got me into Fords. My brother loved the Shelby Cobra. That was one thing that we always talked about. We we're not, him and I we were going to make one. So when I was a little kid, that was one of the things we talked about. But then what really got me is this guy named Carlos Cristobal. Carlos Cristobal got me into passionately loving racing. He used to have all these pictures of these IMSA cars. And guess what car he loved? The 911 RSR from the 1974 to 77. Obviously, the 935 is spectacular. The 962s are spectacular. Those things are precious. But this thing about 911 RSR was a flat six that it sounded, it, it, it was music. So that became the car that I've always dreamed of getting. Okay. So then for me, I started with the passion for Fords and the passion for Porsche. But then what ended up happening is I worked for Orange Blossom Hobbies, making little models. Mm. And, I, and from there, I worked into making the remote control cars. Then I got into racing remote control cars. I started learning about all the suspensions. And the, the, I was fascinated by how cars could perform, how it is to get all this traction into these little pieces of rubber and then to make it turn like all these Gs. It's spectacular. It, like it blew my mind. Now, the thing is, is that that passion, it it's something internal it's not something that can be described in in words it's just it's like spiritual for me it really was so then what ended up happening is that i went off to school while i was in dental school i raced remote control cars you always said how do you do that engineering i always was fascinated by cars always my best friend's dad was a mechanic he owned the place and right it was next to a junkyard where we started getting parts from the junkyard and putting it into our car so that in high school we could drag race it. You know, that was the kind of stuff that I grew up on. So here I am, I became a dentist. I have this passion for racing and I can't race. So guess what? My friend Juan Hernandez and I, we got a, we bought ourselves a cheap go-kart. We ended up going to a Miami Highlight and started racing go-karts. But then you know what? Go-kart racing. As a dentist? As a dentist. <laughs> and the first year out. By the way, the first year out, I was 24 years old. I have great parents. My dad is amazing. My brother's amazing. I bought a place at 24 years old, went out on my own. Half a million dollars at 13%. That's crazy at 24 years old. At the same time, that created so much stress that I had to release the stress somehow. So guess what? Go-kart racing was perfect because I got to do it on Thursday nights and Wednesday nights or Tuesday nights. I don't even remember what night it was, but it took out all my stress. And guess what happens? Racing, when it's your passion, it's also the best therapy there was. There's something about when you are out there and you're racing with 20 other persons that they're going to the extreme limits of their adrenaline to make that car go faster Believe it or not, what you end up doing is you end up taking it to the next higher level. And man, there's a feeling of peace that you get when your adrenaline is that high that you cannot compare. Once you get your hand in a Porsche, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for all of you guys that race other cars. There's nothing like racing an old Porsche. When you learn about racing and you drive a car and you get into the old type of Porsches, that you could make them turn oversteer understeer and that engine that's in the back you can make that car spin as fast as you want or not spin at all with the way you get on the throttle oh my god that is that is the best dance you could ever have my first porsche race car was a 1984 porsche club sport that car 
I raced it initially. I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't know how to race. I thought I knew how to race because I knew how to race go-kart. But they called me, you know what was my nickname? Spin Doctor. <laughs> okay? Because the first time I showed up at these SCCA races and the, and the Nassau Racing and the Porsche Club of America, the PCA and the Porsche BMW Owners Club Racing, those first time I showed up, I was the spin doctor because you know what? I always got the rear end loose because that's the way I like it. I like driving it loose. But then guess what? You end up learning so much when you take the car beyond its limits. Now, that 1984 Club Sport was a standard. Let me tell you, no, nothing done. As a matter of fact, the exhaust broke. And since the exhaust broke, I don't have money. I don't have any sponsors. I don't have anything. So then what did I do? I went back to the original junkyard where we were at. I bought, I got two exhaust pipes off of motorcycles that I used to race. I took the exhaust pipes off the motorcycles and I put it on the Porsche so that the outside of the Porsche, they, they look nice. I welded it together and that's the way I raced the car with an old motorcycle exhaust. But let me tell you something. I got invited to do HSR racing. HSR racing is the historic sports car racing of America. That club has all the big names. The, all my heroes, they race there. From Derek Bell to Hurley Haywood, they were all there. So here I am. I show up there with my friend Juan Hernandez. Okay. My trailer was a 20 foot trailer, Mickey Mouse steel trailer. We show up there with folding chairs and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Come on, you know, that's what we had. Okay, but we raced this car. We're there at this HSR event. Man, they had rigs, 18 wheelers. One rig was just for the masseuse and the kitchen for the people that worked there so that they could get massages and big chef. And here I am with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That's great. But could I tell you something? I raced FIA 5.0. Well, back then, there was this real big-name guy. His name is Eric Bretzel that his daughter used to race, which was incredible race car driver, incredible race car driver. Well, here I am. They were in FIA 5.0 with a, one of these beautiful 1973 RS cars, spectacularly done. They were racing a 3.2-liter engine, just the same size. Here they are, custom-made car. My car like I told you, <laughs> had junkyard parts in it. That's cool. And when we go to qualify, I took the pole. Nice. So they thought I cheated. Hmm. They said, there's no way that this guy comes in with a, this car and he's going to beat all these people. So they call this guy named James Cox. James Cox, for those of you who know, was the man that he knew all about RSRs. He was the man to go to him and Dave White were the two men that you have in my in the United States that knew everything about RSRs, all about Porsches. He comes in, he goes, son, you mind starting the car? So I turned on the car, he puts his hand on my exhaust, takes a look at the car, accelerates it a little bit, takes a look at the car again, and he goes to Eric. Yeah, he beat you with this piece of shit. I want to see this guy in a real car. Now, that guy, James Cox, he became a great friend of mine. So here we are, we're racing. I'm going to HSR. I won my first championship in HSR racing with that car. And he goes to me, Andy, what's your dream car? And I go to him, no, you know what you got there? Those RSRs, those 90, 73 RSR, those are beautiful. But my dream car is the 74, 75 RSR. I like the wide one. I like the big ones. Mm -hmm. You know, you know that song, I like big bucks. Well, that's me. Okay. Sure. Big bucks. Okay. That was it. So then I get a phone call from Frank Jackson. Frank Jackson is Barry Jackson's brother. You know, Barry Jackson auction? Yeah. auction. Well, this is the guy's brother. Okay. So next thing you know, he's asking me, you know, I need a driver for my RSR. Where'd you get my name? Oh, James Cox gave me your name. He's giving me the opportunity to drive my dream car. And then he goes to me, so do you want to buy it? And I go, there's no way I could afford an RSR. There's no way. Okay. Like I told you, I have a huge debt in my office. 
I don't even, you know, like we just started a family. We, you know, we're, we have other priorities. I don't have any money. I know I'm a dentist. Just being here and for me to take the opportunity to drive for you, that's a dream come true. So I cannot afford this car. And he goes, what about if I tell you, I know it's 350000 but what if I tell you 150? Would you take it? And I go, I would love it, but I, 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 I can't. I, I can't. I don't feel comfortable asking people for money, and I really can't. We get to Road Atlanta, the Walter Mitty Challenge. By the way, this is only the second time I drive Road Atlanta. Obviously, we have simulators and all this stuff, and you could drive a simulator all you want. But when it comes down to driving the car of your dream, you're talking about a car that produces 380 horsepower. The car weighs 1,800 pounds. There's no automatic anything. There's no computer-controlled anything. This is, you turn this screw, it means that, and that's the stuff you're set with for the rest of the, the right. length of the race. Right. One thing is to do sprint races. The other thing is to do an endurance race. The Walter Mitty Challenge was an endurance race. Mm -hmm. So here he asked me to drive this car. I'm being baby, I'm babying it, I'm babying it, I'm just taking careful, being careful, being careful. So obviously they only allow 90, I think it was 50 cars on the field. We were 97 cars or I want to say like 90, we're in the 90 car range mm -hmm. to go into this field. You're racing in group nine racing, which is, you're talking about the best of the best in cars, and it's all open class. So you're talking about GT racing. So everything you go, everything goes, whatever you got, got, you got. Mm. So I'm racing this thing, and I'm, there's people with old, you know, what is it, GT1 cars flying right by you with that excited exhaust, mm. which, man, it rocks your head when it goes right by you. And you're going down this street in this car going 140, 150 miles an hour, and they're flying by you, hmm. hitting a turn that's a little chicane type of turn, and then going down a slope that you, it's a blind turn. Dude, I got to tell you, I was scared. And this is a car that I cannot afford to crash. I'm careful. The guy goes up to me and he goes to me, I didn't pay you to be careful. And he goes, first of all, I'm not paying you, but I want you to, everybody to think that I'm paying you. <laughs> Okay, so please go out there and make this car drive the way it could drive. Whoever drives these 911 RSRs, I got to tell you, the only way to drive these things is to get, the re to get them loose. When you get these tires loose, that car becomes a different animal. It is totally different. It's not a go-kart that you could turn here and, tur and it turns. No, it does that, but you got to get on the throttle. You got to be on that throttle and get those rear ends to start moving the car. These tires are bias ply tires. Mm -hmm. They are not going to let go. So my name, the spin doctor, is gone with these tires because the way that that is 14 inch wide tires. You crazy? I got to get on over 7,000 RPMs to get these things to get loose. Mm. And I'm driving this thing. He starts letting me go. Oh my God. I qualified position 54. They only take 50 cars. So I start packing my bag. And the guy goes, what are you doing? You're, I'm 54, I didn't make the final. And he goes, no, you're 54 because there's 22 professional race car drivers in front of you. But those cars, are, those people are not allowed to drive those cars. They qualified the car just to show the car, but those are not the cars racing. I'm sure you're going to have like eight, maybe 10 people drop out. Wow. And yes, consequently, there were seven people dropped out. I qualified three positions from the end. How'd you do? Could I tell you? We drove the race. Little do you know, you have a five-minute mandatory stop. Next thing you know, the car right in front of them, he loses something, the rear part of the wing comes out, comes off, hits my front skirt, blows out the front skirt. I go right in to the, to the pits. I go put into the pits. They tape up the car. Guess what happened? They red flagged the race. Hmm. But if you know racing rules, if you're already in the pits, you get to go back out. But since I came in and I did my mandatory stop while everybody was in red flag, guess what happened? 
I got a free five minutes in the race. So now I'm leading the whole thing in the Walter Mitty Challenge. No way. They didn't tell me anything. But I didn't know that. I just thought, you know, they red flagged the race. They're cleaning it up. But by the time I got out there, it was already on yellow. And then since they started doing the yellow, I got out. Next thing you know, I hear my the crew chief on the radio was a, one of James Cox mechanics, Michael. All of a sudden, it's not Michael on the radio. It's actually James Cox. And then it's not James Cox on the radio. It's actually Eric Bretzel. And it's not just Eric Bretzel on it. It's actually Frank Jackson. He goes to me, dude, do you realize where you're at? We have, you have five minutes to go and you're in third place. Wow. You're winning our category. You got a chance to podium at the Walter Mitty Challenge. The guy in fourth place is right behind you. You make sure that guy does not pass you. Well, you want to know what that guy is in? He's in a brand new 996 RSR. Oh, jeez. Okay? And he's flying right behind me. Let me tell you something. Those five minutes, they became an infinite hour. Because for me, I got to tell you, it was the best time of my life. <laughs> I unloaded everything on the car like it was a dream come true that we flew, came across the turn, coming across the last turn, going off the, under the Suzuki bridge, that you're going down the thing. He's right on your butt. He's about to make your pass. We got to the finish line and I'm right in front of him. I finished third at the Walter wow. Brady Challenge the first time I raced the RSR. Wow. But it doesn't end there. So here we are. Guess what? You get a Rolex. So Frank Jackson's there. Oh. I'm just the driver. I don't get to keep the Rolex. I got to keep the metal. Mm -hmm. That's it. I didn't get to keep anything. He's the owner of the car. And then he goes to me, Andy. So you want to buy the car? And I go, I told you, the only thing I got is $50,000. And he goes, it's yours. What? He sold me the RSR for $50,000 at the end of the Walter Navy Challenge, me winning it. Wow. That's how I took possession of my original Napa Blue RSR. So here I am. I pull into the winner's circle. Mind me, I've never been there before. You're supposed to turn in a CV of all those places you've raised and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't have that. Right. So when the guy's announcing who I am, he goes, and the third place winner is, is, is Andy De Cardenas, a dentist from Miami, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> and here I am, you know, like right next to these big name people that their CVs are like, They've won here and Eric Lux and this and that. I don't have any of these pictures, by the way, so I couldn't share them with you because I didn't take anything to, put, to take. I never expected this. Right. This is like un unbelievable. I raced the car in Napa Blue for a long time. We raced in, in HSR. We raced in FARA. We raced NASA, PC, PBOC, uh, PCA, SCCA. We did all types of racing in the Napa Blue color. When I was racing for HSR, okay, there was a guy that already had the Jägermeister car. And George, which was the original owner of the car, I want to say he ended up getting out of racing because something happened with his illness. But then the Jägermeister was not presented anymore. The Napa Blue RSR turned into the Jägermeister. So then here I was coming to the Miami 500. In the Miami 500, you do a race prior to the Miami 500, which is like a sprint race, like what they do nowadays. In that race, I got a blowout on the NASCAR turn four that blew out the whole rear quarter panel of the car. Hmm. That night, one of my best friends, Scotty File. Scotty, I love you. If you ever get to see this, Scotty, man, you are the man. Scotty came to my house. We had an old Biederman Porsche. 911 RSR, it was a clone, but we had the parts of that car. We cut that part of the car apart that night. We took those parts to the car. We painted it with spray paint and we put it on the car. 
we actually finish the race. Wow. Jägermeister finds out. They gave me a sponsorship. Wow. Because not only did we race, we won. And you know what day it was, the sponsorship? It was the day of my birthday. Wow. Tell me what happened this, this certain day. This is Thanksgiving week in 2015. We're in the Miami 500 here in Homestead. My biggest competition came from Australia. This guy actually built a car to beat me. This field is 97 cars. Obviously, like I told you, we're middle of the class road, but we qualified like positions 38 and 43. He was 38, I was 43. I know my car inside and out. And let me tell you, when I tell you that I know this car inside and out, with Scotty File, we built this car. We've taken this car completely apart, frame up, built the whole car from scratch. I knew that if I pushed this car at the beginning, there's no way he was going to be at the end. Mm. Well, guess what? From positions 38 and 43, by the time of the accidents, we were positions 11 and 12. I was pushing this guy to his limits. He was directly in front of me that I could already feel his brake fade. I could already feel he's losing power. I already feel, I could tell that it's coming down, like it's going to happen. Homestead, turn five. I'm in a four-wheel drift. One of the faster cars comes behind me, just touches my rear end, gets me completely loose, and the car hits the wall. But I'm going so fast that I miss the soft part of the wall, and I hit the concrete part of the wall. My car, they call it the Widowmaker. Why? Because the main torsion bar, the main part of the Toro cage, is a four-inch steel tube. It's attached to the magnesium banana arms. Those magnesium banana arms are supposed to turn into dust. They're not supposed to break a steel tube. No. But when you're going that fast and you hit something like concrete, guess what? It broke the main torsion tube of the car. The roll cage collapsed. And if you know how the roll cage collapsed, that causes the lift of the bottom part of the car. The part, bottom part of the car lifted. Here I am, the seat. I hit the wall with my own helmet. Do you remember anything? I do. I remember talking to my, my daughter, which my daughter back then was my crew chief. My daughter goes into radio silence. She knew something bad happened. Hmm. Well, I got ejected from the car and I hit the wall at 80 miles an hour. I went from 80 to zero in seven feet. They thought my brain had detached from my stem. They really, I was aspirating blood. I had 17 fractures. I was in an instant coma. They had to aspirate me. They put me on in inner tube. They had airlifted me to Kendall Regional Hospital. My poor family. I had 11 surgeries in three months. Okay. I was a month in a coma. I developed heparin induced thrombocytopenia. I developed a heparin induced thrombocytopenia when everything's trying to correct. I had a 3% blood flow through my IVC. They had done compartment syndrome surgeries. They had done every type of fasciotomy. They had done everything to get me to bleed out because everything was starting to coagulate inside my body. You're telling me I took 2,000 pounds of impact? That's crazy. And I'm alive to tell you this? And by the way, no tremors, no nothing? Right. Okay. Yeah, he's my dentist, by the way. So. All right. Yeah, yeah. So, so could you imagine? God is great. My ribs were destroyed. My shoulder, my arm was destroyed. My legs were destroyed. I don't have enough blood flow for everything to work. My legs start swelling up. They put these vacuum packs. They had to cut me open. They're talking about cutting off my legs. Surgery number eight, they put an experimental acid inside of me. When I go into surgery number nine, they give me anesthetic. Three, two, one, I'm still here. Guy saturates me more. Three, two, one, I'm still here. Saturates me more. Three, two, one, I am still here. The guy goes, Andy, I can't give you any more. I saturated you like if you're 800 pounds already. If I saturate you more, you're going to die. You have to make a choice. We could sedate you so that you could pass on, you know, sedated. Or we, we could saturate you and then you're going to die. Hmm. And he goes, wait, wait, wait. My option is die or die? Right. No, there has to be something else. 
And in there, the other doctor that was there goes to me, Andy, I know you. Let me operate you. But you're going to feel everything. He gave me a five-hour surgery. He went into my neck, my groin, and the back of my knee. The next day when the doctor came in, he goes to me, Andy, I've never seen someone suffer as much as you do. I said to God, you saved me. You got to get me out of this. Because with these medications, I can't get close to you. Next thing you know, I went through two weeks of hell. The worst, worst, worst withdrawals you could ever have. But two weeks after, I wasn't in a wheelchair anymore. Two weeks after, I got the walker. And if you like Cuban coffee, I came to the kitchen and I made Cuban coffee with that famosa epumita. I got back to work. Nine months recovery of all this. When they told me I would never recover, three years later, my friend calls me. And he goes to me, Andy, you want to get back into racing? And I go, no, I can't. I made a promise that I, I have to keep. And he goes, well, how would you like to own the car of your dreams? This car was done in 2017 by a guy that he's the actual engineer for Jack Rush. Okay, so what he did is that they made a Jack Rush edition of the car. It's a TRT backdraft. It's an RT3B. That car weighs 2,300 pounds with me in it and it has 560 horsepower. And as we could tell, it flies. It drives and it stops, it turns. It does everything like you could just, it's a dream come true. This car was owned by one of Jack Rosh's engineers, one of the engine builders, which is where I come into this story. That engineer used to race cars with me. When he was there, the bad accident, and then he gave me the ability that when his dad passed away, to get one of his dad's collection. He, he lived in Connecticut, he had the car in Connecticut. So this was a sight unseen. And when I got it, oh my God, it was like the best Christmas you could ever imagine. How does it make you feel driving this car? There's happiness in this world, but then there's the few moments of joy. And if there's anything about this car, no matter who I sit in the car, they get that instant joy. And that's the best part of the car. This car brings out the best in me. This is like the most amazing feeling that you have sitting in the car. Number one, you have all this power. Number two, it have all this performance, but the sound, the vibration, the feel. This is a Dart True 427 small block. Now what they do is that, as you know, Dart is a racing company. They make actual racing engines, so all the the NASCAR cars that they have Dart engines that are Fords, they are made with more oil, more lubrication, more cooling ability. It's detuned for pump gas. The thing that kills you is that you're having a 550 pounds of torque. That torque, the differences on this racing engine is as, as you could tell, it kicks in at about 3000 RPMs. You have a lot of power at 3000 all the way to 6200, 6300. It's all torque. And this thing breaks pretty quick. Oh, you saw it. You saw it. <laughs> yeah. 100 to zero, and I don't know what. Was... It was incredible. Do you miss racing? I do. I do. I really do. You see the shirt that I'm wearing? That's LA6. That kid was a car fiend, mechanic. He was awesome. He was there at my races. Hmm. And let me tell you something. I swore I'm going to help this guy. And let me tell you, he's in heaven right now and he knows that I'm helping him. And we're trying to help out all these underprivileged kids become mechanics for car like that. To become mechanics for Porsches, to become mechanic for the old Mustangs, the old trucks, the old stuff. Because that's an art that is not lost. It's just something that needs to be nourished. And with this foundation, we're trying to nourish it. So. If you can, please help out.